Well, I have here the founding document of Essex University, the Reith Lectures delivered by Albert Sloman in 1963 entitled A University in the Making. It's not often that a, a university has such a detailed blueprint when it starts. Uh, and, and of course, in some ways, it's a very difficult act to follow a set of Reith Lectures. And I also have here uh, Simon Collier, that's Simon Collier, we should all remember because he was the fourth founding father of the history department, and he died a few years ago. So today, in part, I think this is a kind of memorial meeting for Simon, among other things. After 10 years after the university was set up, Simon Collier wrote a little pamphlet called The Story of an Innovation, in which he reflected uh, on the way the blueprint had worked out in practice. Uh, and the fact is that in the initial blueprint, history was scarcely conceived as um, a possibility. Uh, Albert Sloman, for very good reasons, I think, planned to start with just a few very large departments. Uh, in the humanities and social sciences, initially only literature and government. It's true he did say in his Reith lectures, other subjects like history will be taught. And the other feature uh, original feature of Sloman's planning was that <clears throat> he planned that Essex University would specialize in certain areas of the world. Initially, uh, North America, Latin America, and Russia. The idea was that students would be able to compare their own country with other significant parts of the world. Yeah, he felt that most British students have a rather provincial view of the world derived on their, their own uh, school study, and that, in fact, a lot of university departments also had rather provincial uh, view of the world. So the School of Comparative Studies, which was uh, one of the two one of the two founding schools, of, was going to have government and literature centering on the study of Britain, plus those three areas that I've mentioned. And students in the school would have to specialize in one of them and learn the necessary language. That was a, turned out to be a problem because, of course, the great majority of students, as a result, chose North America. <laughs> <coughs> It had initially been intended that they should study Canada, which would have required learning French, but somehow that dropped by the wayside. Anyway, for the purpose of teaching the necessary language, a language centre was created. Well, um, in fact, right from the beginning, the university had to have historians, because there was no way that a student could study Latin America or Russia without knowing quite a bit about their history. Um, and furthermore, another innovative feature was that all first-year students had to take a course in the European Enlightenment. Because a lot of the people who came here at the beginning of the university felt that that was really the birthplace of the modern world, the European Enlightenment of, let's say, the late 17th to early 19th century. Um, so for both of those reasons, it was absolutely crucial to have historians, but no history department yet. So what happened? The first historian was Simon Collier who was appointed to the literature department. I was the second, I came a year later than Simon, and I was attached to the government department, where I taught not only Russian history, but also what the Americans would call political science 101, and also, of course, the European Enlightenment. And, uh, well, it certainly widened my view of the world. I don't know what it did for the students, um, uh, I, but I greatly valued having done that. But. Uh, although I did value it, it has to be said that the arrangement was an awkward one. Uh, and furthermore, in the early years, the university moved in what seemed to me a rather undesirable direction. New departments were created in sociology and economics. And the people who came to those departments were much less sympathetic to history than the people from government and literature. Um, and several of them actually said to me, history is just an auxiliary subject. Um, the implication was that the social scientists would expound the great truths about humanity. The historians would simply provide them with the factual raw material which they needed to do their work. That was the idea. So that historians are mere fact grubbers. Um, the theories and the really important stuff comes from somewhere else. So actually, it took quite a bit of effort to overcome this kind of opposition. Now, actually, during the vital year, 1971 to 2, I was working at the University of Wisconsin in the United States. So in, in actual fact, Simon Collier 
bore the burden of pushing history through the university senate. And I think perhaps Paul Thompson as well, who was in the sociology department, um, a distinguished historian who used oral um, history. He, he was one of the pioneers, really, of oral history in this country. Anyway, Simon records in, the, in his memoir, which I've mentioned, uh, that historians were always rather gentle and moderate in their claims for their own department. And he said he owed his success within the Senate to support from the departments of literature, government, and art. I, I suspect he was being a bit over-modest there. He was actually a formidable debater himself when he wanted to be, and he could be very eloquent in advancing arguments in which he believed strongly. So, at last, in 1972, a history department opened. Uh, we were joined by Harry Lubash and Jerry Wynn, L uh, Lynn, Jerry Lynn. Uh, at first, the history department only ran joint degrees, along with literature, government, and sociology. But later on, we were allowed to set up our own modern history degree with specialisms in the USA, Latin America, and Russia. And eventually, we also set up an MA in comparative history. So it seems to me that the history department, when it was set up, actually reverted in many ways to the original scheme, the original plans of the School of, Slavonic, of, School of Comp uh, Comparative Studies, as I'm slipping into my more recent employment. Uh, so I would say from the outset, the history, the history teachers were model citizens of the School of Comparative Studies. And at that point, I think it's probably time to let someone else take up the story.